When the animation update came to Procreate, I started making my own animation loops. This was the first time that I started making animation loops and I made some really bad mistakes that took a long time. So I wanted to create this list of how to create your workflow so that you can finish your animations much faster. If I had known these 10 tips when I started creating animations, it would have saved me literally days of not only time, but there are a few projects that completely ended up in the trash because I wasn't careful enough and I just didn't have the experience to know what I know now. So I want to make sure that you all have this information at the end of this video. The first tip is the most fundamental of all these. When you begin your project, Break down what types of animations are going to happen in your piece. Different types of animated elements need different approaches. By the end of this video, you'll be able to identify exactly what category each piece belongs to, and therefore you'll have a clear roadmap on how you actually accomplish those movements. Planning for animation is really important. If you don't plan well enough, these mistakes can spiral off into days of wasted work. So. That's the kind of focus of this entire video. When creating base for the animation, create elements that are moving on separate layers. This will make it much easier to edit them individually. Remember to also name these layers. You'll absolutely want to give the past you a hug later when you're using these names to navigate the massive file later. Trust me on this, guys. It will be so much easier if you just name the layers. And if you name the layers in your main group of your main element that you're animating, you can just copy that group into different frames. And there you will have slots with empty layers that are properly named every time in each layer group with the same names so that you have a proper setup of different layers. Also, as an extra tip in this phase is if you want to use some transparency in the main animation elements, you can create a half transparency layer, let's say like 50% layer that is an empty layer if you plan on, for example, animating fog or a dust particle on 50% transparency. Then when you copy the layer group, the layer that has 50% opacity on will be the exact same opacity in every single frame. So you don't have to go in and manually try to adjust to 50% because that can be really time consuming. And it's just a waste of time when you can have that layer already in your layer group. You don't have to trust me on this. Pretty quickly you will see this in action. A quick recap on how layers work. After you open the animation assist, you'll notice that Procreate automatically reads every layer as a single frame. Now this is the important part for the rest of this video. If your layers are in a group, then Procreate will read every group as one frame of the animation. This is how the main elements can remain as separate layers in every frame of the animation. Every element of the animation is on their own layer, but those elements which are named layers now, are part of one layer group. Layer groups are easy to create, you just swipe right on all the layers you want and then hit group button that appears on the top of the layer menu. And if you want to move those layers out of the group later, you just select all of the layers and move them out of the group and you will see that they shift in X position and then you will know that they're no longer part of this layer group. Let's discuss mostly static elements. Mostly static elements are a type of animation where an illustration that is mostly the same is repeated on all frames. That is the bear in this case. The bulk of the body is mostly static element. Since this is also by far the most detailed element on screen, it's also one that I'm not going to bother redrawing for every single frame. It's not relevant to this specific animation, but remember that you can also use transform warp tool to create simple stretch and squash movements. I don't want to use that for this whole body because it would alter the proportions of the bear. I have opted for just moving these arms and that would be in the category of character animation. This category includes limbs and all elements that require almost full redraw for each frame. Here I think I have 
proper bad examples to warn about what not to do, because I messed this up in so many ways. First of all, don't think adding more frames will make the animation look smoother. This is the mistake that has wasted hours and hours from my process. Think of the most distinct silhouettes in that movement, and let's call them keyframes. If those keyframes look okay, it's not that likely that you will mess up filling in the transitions between those poses. But if you try to just move forward and add more frames, creating the animation that way, it's really hard to control how the whole movement is going to look if you don't know the extremes already before you start. Secondly, when sketching the keyframes, just draw the silhouette and focus on looking at the animation. The highlights are pretty easy to add with clipping masks later, but drawing them for each frame in sketching phase is an easy way to waste days into what could just take an hour otherwise. So add the highlights or shadows later, because if you try to work on everything at once, it's really hard to keep track of the movement and how fluid the movement is going to look that way. Background. If you go into your animation assist and tap on the first frame, you can set it as a background. Now if you go to the lowest layer in your layer stack, this is that background layer. Remember that this can also be a layer group. If you have background animation elements, it's better to just draw the base for those elements. For example, there's going to be small flickers and ripples on this small body of water in the lower half of the screen. However, I'm not adding any of those details in the background here, on this layer. As a general rule, any animation that requires you to cover up background elements by redrawing the environment on animation layer takes exponentially longer than using the logic of adding elements on top. So let's say that you have a bug that is flying across the screen. If you have a background layer that already has that bug in one static position, you will have to fill in every single frame to erase that bug from a screen, in addition to animating the bug flying across the screen as well. So you can just skip all of that work in the planning phase and have all the moving elements on a separate layer and not as part of the background layer. Then we have the foreground layer. You can set the foreground the same way that you can set a background. You can use the foreground layer to have static images on top of the animation, but I highly recommend making the foreground layer a layer group too, and drawing animation guides for your animation. Animation guide is a handy tool for any fluid movement. Here I have an animation guide for the direction of the water, the flying path of these butterflies, and the levitating movement of the bear. Let's say that you're creating a walk cycle, for example. You might want to draw an arc to guide the hand of the character as it swings on the side of the character. The little dots around the biggest path here are the markers for individual frames. These ladder-like steps are also markers for different frames. So I counted how many frames I'm going to have for this entire animation, and I just went around the circle and created that many dots, so that when I'm doing frame by frame animation, I know that I'm not going too fast or too slow, that it's going to be about the same length as I have frames. And because this is a looping animation, that's even more important, so that I am filling the negative spaces between those dots, not so that I am just trying to guess how many frames I need to go around the whole loop. Then this tip I wish I could have known much sooner, and it is don't multitask. When drawing frames, try to pick one element at a time and animate the whole loop in one go. This way you'll have a better touch point on what happened in the previous frame, and it's much easier to keep the movement consistent. This is why it's good to have only the mass in silhouette when planning those character animation movements. You can add the other details later, but also do those one at a time. Create a temporary palette. If you have foreground elements in your animation, even if it's just guides, or if you're using transparency of the animation assist, this means that you can see the previous or the next frame as ghosting when you're animating. It's really difficult to use the color picker if you use this though, because it will add in those variables, and those will affect the colors that you are picking. 
This can easily lead to flickering in the final product, so having a custom palette for your animation lets you use the transparency of the animation assist while keeping the process of selecting colors super fast. Remember that you can drag the palette out of the menu and now have it visible as you're working. This will really speed up the process because you don't have to isolate the layer to color pick it separately. It's a whole phase from the whole process and this will add up a lot of speed in the whole process. Work from hardest to easiest. You probably know already what is your hardest part of the animation to solve, so if you have done that first, you know the other parts won't derail you or your project later by needing endless amounts of fixes. Usually anything that requires almost complete redrawing is the hardest part to complete. Then the nearly static ones, because they require more focus on the source frame. For me, the frame by frame elements that only need an animation guide, like these water effects, are the easiest to add. So therefore I added them last, knowing I have something to look forward to. And in the final phase, I added a whole copy of the entire loop and then I added the bare blinking on that copy because then I already had all the other elements doing what they do but I didn't want the bear to be blinking on every single hop of levitation so I copied all the frames and then I hand animated the blink on only one of those loops. And I would say that in this work order, you already know that character animation is probably going to be the hardest part to do, and I would start with a silhouette and do that first. Then add other elements like static movement, and then the frame by frame animations, which can be redrawn for every single frame that are really quick to do. That type of workflow will keep your process moving, and it's just more motivating when you know that you are going towards the more easier and fun parts, not towards something that might even be like impossible for you at this stage. Also, you don't have to cram in all of these different animation elements for every single animation. When you're just starting out, have a basic concept and just know what you can create. And that's much more motivating to start animating something that you know that you can accomplish and then maybe add a little bit of complexity for your next animation and then go from there. You will have finished products from this practice and it's just more fun to get stuff done honestly. Then last but not least, the most important tip out of all of these things, and if you only remember one thing, remember this, because this doesn't just apply for animation, this applies to any like bigger projects that you might be taking on. Make backup states. I cannot stress this highly enough. Now that you know how to identify and animate these parts, be sure to duplicate your Procreate file whenever moving onto the next phase. This way you have a safety net to land on if the next element doesn't work out. This can not only save days from the workflow, but it has literally saved few of my animation loops from being thrown into trash completely. Because just undoing won't work if you need to close the app or take multiple days to make a piece. When you have these backup states from different phases, you won't lose all of your work if one of these elements doesn't work out. For example, I tried to use warp transform for this bear. It's not part of this workflow, but I tried it, but it didn't work out. However, I had a backup state at that phase before I started warp transforming anything, and I didn't lose the entire piece because of this experiment didn't work out, because I had that duplicate that I made beforehand. Now hopefully you will never need it, but if you have it and you need it, then you will really thank yourself for having that option for yourself. The last part of this animation was adding additive light effect on layers, on the foreground layer, and then I used a brighter value in overlay blend mode to push the lighter colors a bit more for contrast. And that's how you make a bear fly. Now, making a bear fly is a really good life skill for you to have, and something that you definitely should add to your CV when you have this done. I'm Mikko, and I'll see you in the next video. Bye!